Welcome to Creativity. We've been looking at building a toolbox of the different aspects that make up a good photo. We identified what makes a good photo, so now we want to learn those techniques so that we can apply to our own photos. And today we're going to be talking about originality and imagination, creativity, hierarchy, separation of objects, story, symbols and metaphor, controlled backgrounds, planning, preparation, mood, atmosphere, and creativity. Those are the sort of topics we're touching on in today's toolbox so that as you develop those skills, you can apply it to your work. And I asked everybody what it is they wanted to get out of the course and why they chose to do the advance. And quite a few people mentioned creativity specifically. And it's something we usually do get. So I'm glad we didn't, we had it in the course, then we took it out. Now it's back. So I'm very glad to have it again. We're doing Today we're going to discuss creativity and the first thing I want to know from you guys is, I know some of you struggle with creativity, let's start by defining what creativity is. Let's hear from each of you, what do you think? You can put it in the chat, I think. Let's see. Give me some keywords for creativity. Oh, see, she's got a, a clipboard there, she's ready for the challenges that are coming. <laughs> Okay, originality, expressiveness, thinking out the box, working overtime, originality. Okay, so these are the typical answers that we get for this sort of thing. Particularly words like original, fresh, um, ability, spontaneity, new, inspiration, innovation, genius, skill, imagination, intellectual, ingenuity, divergent thinking, talent. Those are the sort of words that come up all the time, particularly these ones, original, fresh, new, and innovation. That is what most people will associate with creativity. Gina, before you write those down, wait for the zinger. <laughs> those are terribly limiting words. You don't want those to be your words for the definition of creativity. If you say, I'm going to be creative, or I'm going to take a creative or an original shot, what you are excluding is every single other type of thing that exists in the world. If it already exists, you can't do it because now it won't be new or original. And therefore, it's not creative. So those words are so limiting, they exclude everything. And that is what most people think of as creativity. So I thought of the most random thing that I could think of. I put two words together in the most unlikely way I could come up with, and it was fish playing soccer. Then I did a Google search for images of fish playing soccer. That's how many results I got. I mean, there's pages of it. There's even Mark Fish who played soccer. But <laughs> there are a lot of fish. And that was me trying to pick a topic that I thought there's going to be the least photos of. Because what are the chances? Fish can't do soccer. And there it is. So if I said to you, you have to shoot a topic that has never been seen before. So you pick something like fish which don't have legs and soccer, which is an unlikely sport for them. And then you Google it and you find it. Now that, that topic has gone. It's off the table. You're not allowed to do it anymore. See how limiting it can be. And I just want to show you what someone actually did do with this theme. That shot. How great is that? You, <laughs> if you were going to not do this theme, you would lose out on something like this. So it's a terrible word, you know, or, or confining factors. So there's words like spontaneous or genius or imagination or intellectual or divergent thinking. Those are also very difficult words. If I say to you, be spontaneous now. How does one do that? If you're not spontaneous, like my wife always says, be more spontaneous. Then I have to sit and plan being more spontaneous because it doesn't come naturally, so you can only prepare for it, and then it's not really spontaneous. You know, that and a genius. Okay, you want to be more creative? Go be a genius. Go do that now. Be it, do it now. So those are very difficult words to work with as well. Some of them are very limiting. 
there are some other words there like ideas, ability, skill, ingenuity, talent. And those words are, uh, they're just less limiting. You know, those are things, those are things you can develop. So I'm going to give you a new definition for creativity. Copy, combine, and transform. Those didn't come up in the previous list or in the words that you guys suggested. There's a new definition for creativity, and that is a weird set of words we wouldn't normally think of as relevant. So, um, I mean, Copy is the opposite of original. Combine is not really, and, and transform um, is not really the same thing as new or fresh or innovative. So where does this sort of definition come from? Let's have a look at some creative people. There's some names on the screen that I think most of you would agree have been sort of um, described as being creative individuals. Here's a quote. Creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a bit guilty because they don't really, they didn't really do it. They just saw something. It seemed obvious to them after a while. So there's one of the world's most iconic creative people talking about combining. Here's um, Picasso. Some of you may have heard of him. Art is theft. What he's describing is copy. Here is David Bowie. The only art I'll ever study is the stuff I can steal from. How's that? It's not what we would normally think of as in the terms of um, what creativity is, but one of the best books on creativity, one that really helped me and uh, helped give me the idea and the thinking about creativity, and the more you research it with creative people, you'll see this come up more and more often. The book is Steal Like an Artist. <laughs> which sounds wrong from our original understanding of what creativity is. But just think about how limiting any of those other words are and how much they will stop you from having a process or from making development or they're just limiting. They will just stop. You can't go any further. If that's your start criteria, then you're kind of done. It's a dead end. There's a dead road. There's nowhere to go from there. Um, here's a few other quotes taken from that book. And all those highlighted words are take, steal, copy, imitate, theft, and plagiarism on people talking about creativity. <laughs> I, see it's, I see in the, in, in the videos, I can see there's some revelations happening. This is news to people. I, I like the bottom left one. That's very, 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 very true. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's a, I'll show you another, I think it's on here. There's a great picture. Oh, did I not add it in the end? There's a Banksy where he took that engraving and he scratched out uh, Picasso's name and put his own just to highly emphasize the point. So um, we have this preconceived idea that creativity is about not copying. Like if you're at school, the kid would always shout, My, teacher, he's copying me. You know, there's like this stigma about copying and we always like, oh, I remember when I was at school, if I saw a kid to do a thing, then I, it, I could not do that thing. You know, I had to do my own thing. And so it ruled that thing out, you know. And if you've got a class of 30 kids, then it really becomes tough to have something to do. And it's because it's this own self-imposed limitation that creative people don't really have. They don't think of things in this way, in these terms. People have a, also a fear of being copied. We have a lot of photographers saying, oh, but they, what if they just steal your work? You can't. That's what I've come to learn. This is from Francis Ford Coppola. He was the director of the Godfather series. Uh, highly, highly acclaimed and respected for that work. He says, we want you to take from us. We want you at first to steal from us because you can't steal. You can only take what we give you and you will only put in your own voice. And that's how you find your voice. And that's how you begin. And then one day someone will steal from you. And I have uh, really strongly started to believe this. You cannot steal work. No matter whose picture you copy, you can only come out with your version of it. 
it will be yours, not theirs. It's not the same. You can copy the idea, you can copy the concept, but in the end, you're going to have your picture of that. Here's another great one. Start copying what you love. Copy, 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 copy. At the end of the copy, you will find yourself. I love that sentiment because I believe it's true. So, uh, especially in photography, there's a lot of people who have that limitation of uh, not wanting to do something they've seen or not trying a style because someone else is doing it or something like that. But there is so much benefit to going through that process because every time you shoot, you learn. And what you shoot is far less important than, you know, th that end result is the least interesting part of it. It's the process and whatever, that journey. That's usually what gives you the benefits. So here's something sort of on those lines, but it's actually just a little more of an anecdote. Uh, this guy whose name is Ron, he went out and he shot this lighthouse. It's called Whaleback Lighthouse. It, uh, there was a big storm uh, on its way, and so the sea had got really rough, and so he went out to the lighthouse to shoot it. He was there for about 45 minutes, and every time a wave was hitting the lighthouse, he would shoot uh, in burst mode. So he'd get a bunch of shots and then uh, you know, pick the best from the series. And he posted it on Instagram, and because it was topical, because of the news, uh, because of the storm that was coming in, the news and the news agency picked it up, and they started publishing it, and it got a bit of attention. And then he was following all this attention on his picture, and then someone put a comment that he had stolen this picture from Eric Gendon, or Gendon. And there's Eric's shot. So, he believed he had shot that, and Eric, someone said, you still learned from Eric. So, when he visited Eric's site, he found his picture on Eric's site. So, who stole whose picture now? So, can you go back? There's the two side by side. So, the one's edited differently, but that is the exact same moment in time. No question. The difference is the foreground C looks a little bit different. But that the lighthouse is even from the same angle. And uh, the sea state is an easy edit. You know, you, that could look very different because uh, you can paste anything in there. It's not going to matter very much. But they look the same. So this was not a planned event. It wasn't a photo group that went out to a location. It was a guy who went out on his weekend or whatever to get this shot. He wasn't aware of anyone else at that spot. You know, he was standing in his position and there wasn't anyone next to him. Uh, this can't have been someone who visited that spot 10 minutes later because lots of people go and shoot that lighthouse with waves crashing over it. But look at the waves. They're identical. There's no way that you can go later the day and get that shot. You know what I mean? That's a freak nature, natural instant. So someone did some investigative journalism, you know, the internet. That's where the one guy was standing. That's where the other guy was standing. And you can see in the picture, there's a slight difference between the distance between the banisters. It's because the one person is standing slightly to the right and it sort of closed that gap. And that wave is sticking slightly behind the dome. So it's the same moment in time because the, that wave is actually in the same position. It's just slightly turned around the corner, basically. Two people standing in one spot took a photo in exactly the same instant of time. How unlikely. But yeah, both of them were being accused of theft. <laughs> both of them had the originals. And the chances of the originals lining up that well is impossible. But there it is. Look at this. This is, I'm going to jump. If I jump between the two, look at their composition. Lighthouse doesn't move. Those are the original shots, not recomposed to fit on each other. That's how close the two shots are. Ridiculous. <laughs> Just a bit of fun. So if you try to be truly original, you will find there is no topic left to photograph. And to further make the point, because I so enjoyed my fish soccer idea, I found, I took, picked two, another two random words, the most random that I could. I thought of clouds because they are random organic shape. And what is the least likely shape that I could come up with in the spur of the moment of what would not appear in the clouds? So I thought piano. Then I Googled it and I got this treasure. 
clouds that look like a piano. Now that's not a topic, that's random words. You can do on um, apps and stuff, there's, there's plenty of random word generators, which are great for creativity exercises because they give you a direction. And, and if you pick random words and you Google it, someone's done something like that before, which means there is nothing that hasn't been done. So don't try aim for fresh or original. It just is too limiting. It means there is nothing that can be done. I hope I've convinced you. Copy, combine, transform. That is what creative people believe creativity is. If you look at like the iPhone or any of the great innovations that have happened, they all assemblies of uh, existing products combined. So there was a phone and there was a screen and there was a media player and all of these things. They just went into one device. Every big innovation is just a combination of existing technology shoved into one thing. Sometimes there's something new that is great and changes things, but it's added to something old for it to work. You know, face detection to unlock your phone. There was always face detection and there was always phones. Face detection in phones was a new thing, but neither of them were invented exclusively in that moment. So our brain is a very, very impressive machine in that it can do all sorts of amazing things and it works things out. And it really, it, what it does is it tries to recognize patterns because it makes it easier to sort the amount of information we have to sort of deal with. The problem is it becomes so good at that, it becomes quite lazy. It doesn't, um, it doesn't, it does it the easy way as opposed to the correct way, basically. And it does shortcuts and it, uh, you have to, it's, it's that thing that you've probably come across at many stages in your photography journey, people saying learning to see. We see all the time, but what our brain does is it filters everything we see so that our heads don't explode. If we actually saw everything that was in front of us and every miracle that was occurring and every tree and every leaf and every bird and every smell and every sight and every sound and every sense was hitting us at one moment, it would, it would probably destroy us. It's too much to take in. Our brain is basically working like a big old filter to try and sort of take in what it needs to. Even what we take in is, we're not taking it in at that moment. It's reserved to us as a memory. There's actually a slight lag. When someone, when a baseball player hits a baseball, he's swinging out of reflex and then he recreates the position of the baseball after the fact. It's actually happening too fast. There's a lag on our brain. Anyway, so uh, let's see who's first. Len is on top of my list here and top of the screen there. Len, you can unmute your microphone. You're going to read this next um, slide to us. A bird in the, the bush. Well done, Len. <laughs> a bird in the, the bush. There's two thus. But the way they're positioned, we can miss it. Because we just assume and we sort of fill in the blanks and, and we, you know, there shouldn't be two of those. So we just ignore one of them. The one of the best ways to sort of find a problem like this is uh, if you turn something up down, you'll see how much easier it is to spot the two of those. So a lot of learning to see and learning to think about things and learning, you know, to sort of stop the brain over filtering is just to change the situation of the circumstance a little bit in a different way so that we don't uh, get so easily fooled. Uh, like this sentence here. <laughs> just for everyone who thought there was something very inappropriate in this class, it actually says, I got a dig big, you that read wrong, that awkward when you, read that wrong too and said moment after awkward this is awkward you see how many things we could auto fill in that sentence because we scan but it's not actually like that especially with awkward you you want to put moment in there so badly because you're so used to it being there but it's not there we just fill it in and that's what our brain is doing all the time all the time and we just uh, we, we, we take it for granted. We just sort of, we don't see the stuff. We don't, it just goes past us. 
So we're going to do a creative exercise now, which I've been threatening for weeks. <laughs> so if you printed out the sheet, grab it. Um, if you don't have a sheet, just a piece of paper will work fine. We're going to draw in that uh, drawing box number one. This is drawing one. There's a little box. See, because I'm so kind, I've made third lines in your picture so you can draw it with composition even. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you four minutes to draw this. And what you're going to draw from your memory is the whole... Oh, let's get everyone a chance to get their pens and papers and everything. We're all set. Donnie, you ready for your exercise? You promised me you were going to participate on this. Oh, he's hiding. Um, okay, so what you're going to draw in that first box is... I've got a four minute timer here as well. You're going to draw the home screen of your phone. You're going to put the icons with their little pictures, their shapes, their position, their order, which side of the top of the face you get your, your everyone's looking around desperately. Put your phones down. This is from memory. <laughs> you have to draw what your wallpaper background is. You have to draw where your time sits and where your little signal sits. I want you to do all of the, as much detail of your phone as you can from memory. And it starts now. One minute.
10. That's time. <laughs> so how did it go? <laughs> Shockingly. <laughs> so obviously the big joke of this exercise is we look at our phones 50 times a day. Some people more, not many people much less than that. But in a day you open your, you put your, you have your phone in your hand a bunch of bunch of times. And you have chosen that layout on your phone, most of you, except for Michael and his Nokia. But there's apps that you use. You put them on your front screen. You choose your position. Every time you want to know what the time is, you whip out your phone. You know where that's sitting, but you can't recreate it. What I used to do for this exercise was actually you have to draw your car dashboard. So you have to put which side is your odometer and where is your rev counter. My wife didn't know she didn't have one in her first car. And, but um, I don't think most of us have been in our car that much at the moment. So it's more understandable <laughs> that you don't know what it looks like. But your phone, you should be able to see. Uh, just another version of it is uh, what does your watch that you wear every day look like? Can you draw the face of your watch? What are the, the numbers? Are they Roman numerals or just numbers or how many are missing? Or what does the bevel look like? Or, you know? And it's stuff that we just basically desensitize to and our brain just filters it because we see it so often that uh, we just, we don't really file it in a way. It's interesting to become, discover. You become so accustomed to where everything is that yeah. it's, it's your autopilot. When you open your phone, you know exactly where the app is. You open it and you carry on. You don't think about it. For me, a car dashboard is easier because I look at it a few times a day. I don't look at it all day, all the time. Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, you're right. It's, it's weird when you try and draw it. I actually couldn't even figure out where to start because I actually didn't know where the whole thing was. <laughs> I had to really think that one right through. Which side does the camera sit? Where's the earpiece, you know? And uh, that, that you, I used a great, you used a great word, the autopilot. Autopilot is exactly what we're fighting against. That pattern forming brain is an autopilot. And if you want to come off autopilot, it's actually a bit of work and a bit of um, awareness and consciousness and thought and effort. Uh, it's doable. And that's what learning to see is. It's just fighting your autopilot, which is a very well established process. Your brain is designed for autopilot. No, absolutely. I mean, that, that phrase that Len read, uh, I think everybody read it the first time exactly without the, the, the. I did. I looked at it and just recreated it as, as I knew it should be, not as it yeah. actually was. Only when he read it and he read it word for word, did I actually think, oh, hell. <laughs> there we go. Picked the wrong guy. I'm putting Len at the bottom of my list here. <laughs> and thanks for making my point, Len. Okay. <laughs> Have a look at this exercise that, uh, let's see this. This was a, it was called the candle problem. So this, they, they did research where what you had to do is you had to, you were given these tools and you had to take the candle and you had to stick it to the wall. You had a limited time. And then they did the test in two different ways. And in one group they did, they got to the end result much better. And in another group, they never, you know, didn't perform as well. And the difference was, this is the correct answer for how you're supposed to attach the, the candle to the wall is you use the tax and the box to put the candle up. What people were trying to do is melt the wax and try and stick the candle on sideways and all sorts of things. But the difference between the two tests and the two results was in the one they had, they gave the people these tools. So there was the candle and the tax and the matches and the box. And to the other group, they gave the tax in the box. And then it looked like the box's job was to hold the tax together, not it was one of the resources you had available to you. So depending on how creative you were and how able you were to literally think out of that box would be uh, would determine how well you solved the problem. But that's a form of functional fixedness. There are rules that we impose uh, ourselves they're not there but we like you don't think the box is an option because it's there to hold the pins 
if you are given it with the pins out, then you can maybe see that, oh, there's another resource. And that's a problem, again, is sort of that autopilot pattern forming brain. We don't always see what's available. And I've seen with the photographers, you know, photography is a very creative field. And when I give out an exercise or something, a lot of people say, can we do this? Are we allowed that? You know, what are the rules? But the rules are um, most often self-imposed. You know, this is not the photo club. The photo club, they love their rules. There's a right and a wrong, you know. But apart from that, a lot of the times the problems are self-made. They're not there. Have a look at this problem here. So this is a little two bits of wood, right? And it's got a groove cut into it. It's called a dovetail groove. And that the one piece is gouged out and the other piece is sitting proud and you can slide the two together. That will combine those two bits of wood and they will um, hold together very nicely. You can't pull them apart, but you can slide them apart through that groove that's been made there. So it's used a lot by carpentry. So how, is this possible? Now you've got a groove at 90 degrees to itself. <laughs> some I must find my screenshot button. There's some great faces happening here. <laughs> is it possible? I'm not asking you, Len. You're at the bottom of my list, Len. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know about yours, Len. <laughs> so have a look at this. If we change the question, how could we make a box in the picture so that it is still possible to slide the two pieces? Is that a bit easier of a question to answer? It implies it is possible, not impossible. And maybe there is an answer. It's just wording. And you'll find one of the big problems with creativity is the schooling system. Uh, oh, I added great resources. I saw some of you watched it. I think uh, tomorrow was one uh, on the, the TED Talks. There was that there's the great one on um, creativity there and how the school system is just not set up for it. It's a very old system. It was set up at the end of the Industrial Revolution to try and cope with children and it doesn't favor creativity in any way and the way a lot of the things are worded and set up in the world take away that so if you say how um, is this possible is this impossible it kind of creates a functional fixedness in your mind that you can't solve a problem and uh have a look at this there's basically the answer that dovetail groove is done at 45 degree angle so you can see it on the front and you can see it on the side, but it's not running front to back. It's running side to side. But because that box is cut there at that 45 degrees to the dovetail, then you see the front edge of it, which makes it look flat. So it is possible. But one of the big problems is just, you know, the wording of it can be a, a big limiting factor. It's the same as putting those pins inside the box. It limits what you think you can do. Uh, I'll give you another example of that as well, but we're going to do a creative exercise. So in that drawing gap number two, which is drawing two, you have three minutes. You are going to draw. Everyone ready? <laughs> a bicycle from memory. Go. Sheena, this is not phone a friend. Spectacular tomorrow. 
You've you've still got two minutes to give it another go. Uh, Len, you can sit on your hands for the rest of the class. <laughs> In. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> uh, obviously the idea in that exercise or what I'm hoping to expose is a bicycle is something we all have ridden and all are used to and we all see all the time, but do you know how all the parts attach to each other? Can you get the pedals and the chain to touch the wheel in the right place? It's not so easy to do it from memory. Suddenly, it's a feat of engineering. Like, how does the front handlebar and the front wheel not have a chain on it that you can still turn the wheel? And <laughs> where do all the parts go? Carissa, I need to see yours. That face. Let me see. What did you do? Yeah, that bike's not going anywhere. <laughs> Sheena? Let's see. I forgot the pedals. Don't know how she pedals. But I forgot to draw pedals. <laughs> it looks closer. You know, you've got a loop between both of your wheels. A few people did that. I've seen that before. You and Artie, let's see. <laughs> uh, hey, oh, that's. Uh, you, where's your front handlebox? I can't see it in the light. <laughs> so there. Okay, I think there's a few bikes that are certainly not going to go anyway, but um, some some good ones there. <laughs> it's interesting though, isn't it, to find out that something like a bike which you know and you like and you've ridden and you're used to, you actually can't put one together on paper. Never mind, imagine having to try and build one now. You can't have a chain from both. <laughs> front and back wheels and how does the pedals link to it and everything. <laughs> Len's got 28 gears on his. <laughs> Len showed me this is very good people. He's not fun in this class. He's not here for my entertainment. I'm, I'm going to show you quickly um, a bike just to refresh some of your memories on how the handlebars come attached to the front wheel and there's that spoke that goes down to where your pedals are that links the back chain and there's you have to somehow fit a seat on a bar as well there <laughs> familiar <laughs> for tune let's see yeah i want to see yours you're laughing so hard you, it's got to be a you good want one. to see mine i want to see <laughs> <It's yours>. terrible <laughs> let's go <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, they're fun exercises. It's just to show you that the stuff we take for granted, you know.
and how our brain is basically filled in gaps and when we have to actually switch off autopilot where do we get to um okay the next exercise on your list there's uh list one has got five extra bold stripes that's a place where you're going to write now because i only need five uses for a bar stool uh, you have 30 seconds for that How did we do? Hold up on your hands how many you got. Four, 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 five. Four, four, two. <laughs> okay, another four. So most people got about four in 30 seconds. So uh, a bar stool, everyone knows what a bar stool looks like. We all have an idea of a bar stool. Um, but if I say I need five uses for a bar stool, the chances of you being able to find a whole lot of options are limited by me asking you specifically for uses for a bar stool because it's got a label, it's got a description. And that kind of tells you what it is and what it does. And so it is much harder within those parameters to try and find um, uses for it. Have a look at uh, this here. Um, I was listening to a podcast where these scientists were used to uh, give advice, scientific advice for movies. So a movie is a science fiction story and they've got th this thing happen. For example, this spaceship time traveled. Now you need a consultant scientist to explain how that happened. And the scientists will all tell you it's impossible. In our current thinking and understanding of the universe, time travel isn't possible. It doesn't fit within the mathematics as we understand it right now. And that's what you get your answer on. On it, with every time someone's trying to work with a scientist on a movie, the movie, the scientist is saying, "Yeah, but that's not possible. That's not possible. That can't happen. That's not possible." What you have to ask a scientist if you are trying to do this is, "This spaceship time traveled. How did it happen?" Then they will say, oh, well, then it could be like this. It could be like this. It could be like this. There's the infinite cylinder. It could have gone through a black hole. It could have, uh, it could have gone through a wormhole, um, cosmic strings, relativity. There's all these different options and theories that have been developed around time travel that you could draw on to sort of fill in the blanks of, blanks of the story. And the difference is how you phrase the question. If you say, how did it happen? They'll say it can't. If you say it did happen, you have to explain it. Then it gives you a whole different pattern and process with which to work to try and make it. And the same with a bar stool. Having called it a bar stool makes it a bit of a challenge. If I give you a picture reference and I say, list as many uses as you can for this convenient object. Now I'm gonna give you uh, two minutes to fill in the rest of the list, see how many more options you can get this time.
there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of steering off into the distance happening. Okay, time's up. How did we do this time? A little bit better? Four more tomorrow. Ten, that's better. Nine. Okay. Oh, five. <laughs> Six more. Five more. I hope that what happens is after a while, your answers get sillier and more creative, creative, as in just out there. Like the first time when you say a bar stool, then you say like a ladder or something to stand on or sit on or something to hold things or whatever, a very literal sort of other things that you have used a bar stool for. If you have a bar stool and you needed to change a light bulb, then the one time you use that thing. But with this upside down wooden object, you can start calling it a coat stand or a, a prison for midgets or any sort of thing. You can start getting sillier and sillier the, the more you go. It's just about letting go and doing numbers more and more and more. The more you have to do, the more you'll end up with. Which is what brings us to our next exercise. In that next place for a list, in two minutes, 30 seconds, what is this a picture of? Give me a list of things that this is. One minute. How did we do? <laughs> six, nine, six, eight, nine, five, five. Platoon, what was that? Four. And Rina says five. Lee, Lee 13. Lee's on fire. So, uh, this is a this is a properly creative exercise in that there's no right answer. This thing doesn't have any pre-consisting ideas for you. It's a picture of something you've never seen before. So you can't really, uh, you know, there's nothing you can associate it with. You have to come up with answers. And what 
generates ideas is ideas. The more you have, the easier it becomes. And the more of these exercises you do, the more you have to sort of draw on. Creativity makes creativity. Makes sense. Okay, the next one. You need this uh, page of circles. If you don't have it, just draw a bunch of circles. There's 35 on this page. The next exercise is also time. So the reason you would want to draw it beforehand is just so that you don't have to, in the time, that as the countdown is going, also be drawing the circles. It's 35 circles, which is 246 by 245. And keep them small, it'll just make um, it a bit easier. If you can draw a perfect circle, it's supposed to be a sign that you're mad. And we had a geography teacher who could draw perfect circles. So every time he did something about the earth, he would go, and the class would go, it's quite a cool skill to have. That's, that's in fact all I remember about that year of geography. <laughs> I don't even remember his name. I just remember the circles. Uh, okay, so everybody's set. You're as set as you're getting. In the 35 circles, draw as many round things as you can within three minutes. That's about five seconds per circle. So don't linger. It's not about detail, it's about quantity. Go. Less than a minute. Thirty seconds. Twenty.
10 seconds. Time. Pencils down. <laughs> so, who found my panicky countdown helpful? No who one. <laughs> who found when I started mentioning the time in that panicky way that at that moment they managed to think of three more ideas or all the ideas in their head went away? <laughs> Tend to hit a blank. It will do that. So the funny, <laughs> the funny thing about creativity is, it's way easier to destroy than it is to foster. I used to do in this class the fun thing of shouting at someone like Sheena, "Give me the greatest photography idea you've ever had." Now, not something stupid. Now. <laughs> there is no way you can come up with anything under those circumstances. If someone yells at you and they lean forward and they raise their voice and they say like something like not something stupid, then whatever idea you had in your head, you automatically self edit, you know, that idea is gone because now the stakes are up. Um, anything like that will, Anything that heightens um, stress or tension or anxiety is terrible for creativity. So there's far more ways. And I just showed you how uh, just changing the wording of certain things can also mess with your ability to be creative. One of the worst things you can do for creativity is pay someone. Because being handed money to perform or to do something is, can be crippling anxiety for when you're supposed to be being creative. It will kill creativity, you know. Because uh, now you've got expectations and you've got to deliver results and there's people who are waiting on that stuff and they've given you money and now it has to be worth that money and all sorts of problems like that. So it's very difficult. So there's a lot more ways to kill creativity than there are to create it. So to be in a creative environment is very difficult. There's the, there's, because if people don't understand creativity or know what it is, the chances of them ruining it. For example... Yeah, thank you, Rob. I did do the maths again, and I see there's 30 circles, and I have no idea why. And so you actually had six seconds per circle, so I do expect spectacular work on them. Um, <laughs> if you're in an environment that's, that there is someone who doesn't get creativity, they will destroy it for everyone. They, because if they say you know, demeaning or negative things, uh, quite often in a, in a work environment, you do brainstorming sessions. And if people are not open, to brainstorming sessions or they edit during a session the, the idea of a brainstorming is you everyone says stuff and you list it all you list everything if people edit while you're trying to give suggestions the suggestions dry up because now there's a filtering system there's a criteria it has to be good enough uh, and then your idea might not fit into that you write everything down and so it's very easy to disrupt the flow or to stop creativity let's have a look at these circles i want to know from each of you what did you do um so for example how many circles did you get in before you started like combining make two circles into one item when did you start drawing outside the circles to try and get something from them how often did you get to an object like a ball and then you think oh there's like 50 types of ball in sports. And then you start going. Tuk, 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 tuk. That's one example of how ideas generate ideas. If you think of a coin, you can make every denomination. But if you do stop and think about how many oh, smiley faces, that's a good one. We never used to have emojis, you know, <laughs> emojis you can go forever now. But uh, if you just think for just a second, how many things in the world are around? It's a lot. You know, there's no end to the amount of round things you could draw, or list, or label, or whatever. But it's very hard for us to get to that number on the sheet now, suddenly, because of the time pressure and the countdown, and me shouting in your heads that it's running out, and um, anxiety and self editing. I bet you some of you had an idea and then said, no, that's stupid, and then didn't write it down. This is just how it works, you know, that's how it goes. So, um, yeah, and also 
the, uh, the, there's no criteria for quality here. You have to do quantity. But sometimes we also get stuck and fixated on that. And these are all self-imposed problems or external forces that really mess with us. So let me just quickly summarize from the things we've gone through, some of these uh, things that help with creativity. So practice. It is a skill to be developed. We looked at that list of words, and it's a skill. And skills aren't necessarily innate. They grow through practice and through doing them again and again and getting used to it. You can become more creative. Um, quantity over quality. Quality is a self-editing process. It's a way of restricting you from doing something because you, have, you end up making criteria. What you want is lots. Ideas create ideas. And if you have ideas, then you can take something and you can copy it, or you can combine it, or you can transform it. And that's why it's useful to have lots. Um, reframing to remove mental blocks and self-imposed limiting factors. That's sometimes just rewording the problem. Instead of saying, is this possible? Saying, how is this possible? Or something like that. It can be very simple, but it just makes you think that there is an answer available, as opposed to there isn't a way. Or... Um, specifically with like um, conflict resolution you know you have a point of view have a point of view somewhere's a middle ground what do we all believe and how do we work towards that well now we've got a different way of approaching the same problem kids are very good at creativity because they don't have that inhibition and the inhibition is that self-editing that little voice that stops us from doing or flowing or carrying on um, restrictions a lot of the restrictions, uh, this is under, remember, this is things that help creativity, and I've got restrictions there. It can be a very helpful thing. If I say to you, your homework is to go and take the best picture you've ever done, it will cripple you. You won't be able to. If I say, go do the best picture you can do with the color red during sunset, now already you've got ideas popping in your head. You might change or whatever, but you've got a start point. You've got things forming. Um, I quite like when we go out on the outings and the street photography stuff is to make a, a restriction or a limitation. Take one lens, a fixed prime that you can't zoom or whatever. And then if you see shots and you're like, oh, I can't get that. I don't have the right lens. But then you have to start looking for what does suit that lens. And um, we do a few on the... Um, on the practical outing, we're going to do some restrictions, but it can actually be helpful. Some defining parameters, some limitations, some boxing can help creativity because sometimes too much options is uh, limiting in itself. It's you end up getting stuck or trapped or making uh, problems that aren't there. But if you have, you say, I need to get from here to there, and I've got these three tools, it's actually more helpful than how do you get there. And then acceptance and positivity, uh, positivity to, and being prepared to be wrong. Any negativity is very, very, very bad for creativity. It stops it and it shuts down the process and it creates that editing again. Self-editing or external voices stopping it. Being wrong is not bad. We've learned in our society that, uh, you know, we do like negative marking and you don't get a hundred out of a hundred. It's a problem. And if you don't get something right, you know, you, you get a test, you do something wrong, you failed in computer games. When you do a level, you try it again and again and again and again until you get through it. You develop through repetition and through learning it. And with a lot of other things, <laughs> we don't do that way. I've filmed a lot of banks and they got this idea in their head and they were talking about fail fast. And that became like a drinking, uh, if a drinking game in the, in the banking world. If you hear that come up, that and um, what was the other one? Disruptive technology. Oh my goodness, they got excited about that. But basically, trying to embrace that getting things wrong, but doing it quickly so you can learn from it and then fix it. But it's not such a terrible thing to be wrong as we think in our head. Makes sense. Oh, yeah. We nearly finished, Donny. Don't worry. <laughs> One more slide. Um, things that will kill creativity. So pressure. 
And pressure can also be in the form of payment or expectation or deadlines or sometimes deadlines are good because it's a restriction. Uh, if you have no deadline, then you can carry on forever and you never get anything done. But pressure is a, is, can be very bad for it. To punish mistakes, that will kill it. If I say to you, that's a stupid idea, the chance of you giving me more ideas just diminishes dramatically because uh, that closes down the process. Because now you don't know what the criteria is for a, a good idea versus a stupid idea. How do you use that information to, to, to contribute more? We get educated out of it. So creativity in the schooling system is really poorly handled. Teachers don't handle it. They don't know about it. They teach things like it has to be original. You know, why are you doing the same as me? Or I've done this. Everyone think of their own thing. That's not how we learn. You copy. That's fine. It is undervalued. I couldn't believe when I traveled Europe how much more they sort of appreciated art. Just it's in the streets, it's on the sidewalks, it's in the graffiti, it's on the wall signs of the shops, it's in the posters. There's just like a completely different acceptance of art as a real thing as opposed to in the South African environment. Um, it is much easier to destroy than it is to create. So that's one of the reasons people shrink down on creativity. And then self-editing, I think, is one of the biggest ones. It's the little voice inside us that stops us. It's us that stops us, not other things quite often. When you're doing your little circles and you're like, no, not that one. Why? You know, what made you say no? You can get it wrong. There's no, it's not a high stakes game. You've got to fill out those little gaps. And if you miss one or you do repeat one or whatever, so what? It's, there's no price to pay for that. That's it. It's fine. You know, self-editing. It's self-doubt and our self, the voice in our head that's a problem.